how you were able to build amazing relationships and where do you see people go wrong. Service is healing. But when do you know you're on the right path? Here today with the one and only Evan Carmichael. Welcome, my friend, to the Human to Human podcast. Much love, man. Good to be here. Fellow Torontonian, I'm excited to, to dish it up. Originally from Newfoundland, though, now in Toronto. Wow. Okay. Okay. I've got a bunch of questions for you. You are one of the most fascinating people, I think, hands down, um, out of not just the people that I've been following, but from the entrepreneurship space in general. And I want to ask you, uh, why do you think you were put here on this planet? I, I don't know, put here on this planet, but I think, I think humans are built to serve. Uh, and so when people ask me, like, what's my purpose? What should I do? Well, your purpose is to help others. Your purpose is, I think your purpose comes from your pain. So whatever you struggle the most with as a human is the thing that you want to help other people through. And we're not done growing. You still have a long way to go. I do too. Like everybody's still on this constant journey of growth and learning, but you've come a long way and you know more than who you used to be. If you think back five years, seven years, 10 years, the person who you used to be, who was struggling, who didn't like their life as much. And there's lots of people who currently are like that person, right? Like who you used to be. And you're, 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 you're able to help them. And that'll fill you up to a whole new level. And so I think your purpose comes from your pain and your pain defines you one way or the other. Some people just stay in that pain and feel like I can never go off and do anything because I struggled with, with X, Y, Z. Um, and other people let that pain define them in a positive way to say, I don't want anybody else to ever have to go through what I went through and I'm going to serve the world through it. Was it difficult to find your purpose? I mean, was it difficult? And obviously I think, you just said you've still got a long ways to grow. And I think having that growth mindset is beyond important. But when do you know you're on the right path? I think you just feel it. You know, I think, I think it's like, when do you know when you're in love? You feel it. And I think we've all felt it. I think we just find really smart ways and reasons why we can't do something. I think this is the battle between our head and our heart. You know, I think most people, when they say, well, I need to wrap my head around that. No, you need to wrap your heart around it. You make the big decisions in life with your heart and then the small ones with your head. And they, they very rarely align because your head is designed to keep you safe. Your head understands a world that currently exists. Your head is practical. Your heart can create something that hasn't existed before, that's never been done before. And so you have this vision for what you want to make and then your head will find all the reasons why you can't do it. Well, you don't have the money or the resources or education or family or connections or good looks or whatever to be able to go off and do it. Uh, and so it's very common that your head and your heart fight each other. And you need to let your, your heart decide the big decisions. And then you take your head along with you to say, okay, I'm doing this. Now let's mm -hmm. find smart reasons for how to actually go off and make it happen. Um, so I think, I think people often will find really smart reasons why they can't win. And your listeners, your viewers are smart people. You're not going to believe a stupid reason. It's a really smart reason why you can't win. Uh, but instead, make those big decisions with your heart. Would you say at any point in the last 90 days, have you had moments? Have you had crossroads? Have you had moments of uncertainty? Have you had moments of where that head and heart do conflict? And I'm curious to hear if, if you've had those moments and... It's very easy for us to justify, of course, logically. We often hear that. And I think about a lot of entrepreneurs in, in particular, they think about the logical side of things. Hey, I need to make, Evan, I need to make 30K a month or I just, I won't be able to breathe. I need to make 50K a month. I won't be able to breathe. And it just gets bigger and bigger. And it's just this rat race. And I'm curious, just recently in the last three months, have you had any of these head versus heart moments? It's a constant battle. And it's a constant reminder. It's a constant fight to be the person who you want to be. So even last night, so I do a daily thing on my Instagram where I, in the morning I post, uh, hey, who has questions for me? And I have this little question and then people ask questions throughout the day. And then at the end of my day, I go through and I answer basically as many as I can until, <laughs> until like I'm ready to pass out. Um, and yesterday was, a, was a, a tough day. We've got a you know, family member who's struggling with cancer and... Um, you know, we went to go see her and, and uh, just a tough emotional day. And I got back home 
and I hadn't done my Instagram questions yet. And it's easy to say, okay, well, I'm tired, um, had a rough day, uh, people will understand all the logical reasons, but you know, practically that doesn't make sense. Like, why am I doing it? It doesn't make sense. I'm not, I'm not getting paid to do it. I'm answering questions one at a time. Like it's not a good use of my time logically, but I love it. And I just remind myself, but, but I love it. And so I'm going to do it. And it's funny because it actually becomes the healing, right? Like I felt service is always the answer. Like service is how you heal. I felt better about everything that's been happening about my life, about the situation, because I knew that I could still, that I, however many questions I answered last night, I don't know, 20, 25, 30, uh, that it had an impact on some people. When I broke my neck, so last year I was on a tour, we did 23 cities in 90 days, and I broke my neck halfway through the, the tour. And my agent and my family were like, when are you coming home? Like, well, I'm not. I'm going to finish my tour with the broken neck and like concussion and everything. And I, because sitting at home is not as much healing as being with entrepreneurs serving. So I went to, I don't know how many more cities every four days and sat at the front of the room with like three pillows behind me and an ice pack on my neck. And I spoke for four hours because that was healing for me because service is healing. Um, and so logically that doesn't make sense. you right. Like go home and lie in bed, but that's not how I was going to get better. Uh, and so I think, forget about last 90 days. I think it's a daily thing that we do. I think daily we'll find reasons why we can't do something. And, and daily we believe it. I'm sure I've already played small 18 times today and it's only like noon. <laughs> I don't even notice it, right? That's the, that's the problem. I think we play small by default. I think we play small just on the subconscious level. And it's when you bring it to the conscious level that you actually recognize it. What do you do then? And, and I hope and I try to encourage myself to have the courage to do the difficult thing when I find it because it's popped up and uh, I want to just take action on it. I appreciate you saying that, especially that whole one-to-one. I've, I've been following your Instagram. I see the daily work that you're putting in just from a question standpoint, let alone everything else. And some of the questions you get asked is just an, an emoji and you'll still answer it. So I get to you, you know, you're super authentic when it comes to that front. You will literally answer every single question, no matter what language it's in, you'll find a way. And I'm personally noticing this trend in the entrepreneurship space of scale. And I know scale is always kind of a hot topic and everyone is now trying to scale relationships. And it's just this one-to-one -one model that you have on Instagram, forget Instagram, you genuinely care about people one-to-one. -one. Have you noticed any sort of trends in the spaces that, that you hang out in where you're noticing that entrepreneurs are trying to scale relationships or trying to automate this, automate that, and they're forgetting about their service because of a dollar? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody cares about people. Um, I'm not special. I think you care about people. I think I care about people. I think your audience, people listening, watching, they care about people too. Uh, and I think if you, that's yes, why I wrote Built to Serve, because you, you are built to serve. It's hardwired into you. Helping other people hits the same part of your brain as having food and having sex, which are also both pretty important. Uh, turns out <laughs> as a human. So if you're not happy, it's a good chance because you're not serving, you're not helping and you have to feel the emotional connection. Um, you know, I have, I had, I don't know, 400,000 people watch my videos yesterday. I don't know what that means. I mean, it's great. I'm honored, but I don't feel what that means. That's a, that's almost Newfoundland. Watch my, <laughs> watch my videos yesterday. Right. Uh, but talking to somebody on an Instagram live or doing a one-on-one -on -one and that I feel now I can't only do that because you also have to, you have to make money as a business. If you don't make money as an entrepreneur, you're not going to be an entrepreneur for very long. And so it's a constant battle, uh, of where you spend your time. But I, I make sure that every day I'm doing something that makes me feel like the work that I do matters to somebody, even if it's a one-off. 
Um, and I do a lot of it on Instagram. I do a lot of it privately that, that I don't share that just fills up my soul. And I do work at scale and we have, I don't know, 7,000 videos or something across my channels, some, some bonkers number. Um, so I love scale, but I also equally love the feeling that I'm doing work that matters. I totally hear you on that front. Nothing beats a a one-on-one type of conversation or even in a group setting. And when I left my corporate job last year and started my business, Jube, for me, a part of me felt guilty for monetizing relationships. And I'm sure like you, you know, you would give and give and give and give and give without necessarily tagging a dollar figure to it or any sort of package or a rate or a program. But I also realized the importance of entrepreneurship and having that business. And could you tell me a little bit about like, did you have an idea of what type of business you wanted to create? So you started creating videos and YouTube videos and started blowing up, started writing books from a business standpoint, did you have any sort of inspiration? And I know you always say like, follow the model for success. Was there something you were following when you decided to launch your, your first business? My first business? Well, no, this business in particular. Oh, this business, like my YouTube thought leadership yeah. kind of business. So my path into this was actually not YouTube. I started with my website. So I was making content. I had a website. Um, you know, I, I think impact and business at the same time, right? I, when I j- dive into something, I'm always looking, how can I turn this into a business opportunity? It's just how I like to think. Because if you can make it into a business, you can support yourself, you can build a team and then go out and have a bigger impact. Mm-hmm. So I started with my website. I don't know how long ago I'm... I'm 40 now, so that was when I was like 23, 22, 23. Yeah, you look the exact same age as me. I'm, I'm <laughs> turning 31 next month. You okay. look the exact same. <laughs> Dude, you got a lot more hair. You got a lot more hair uh, than a I A little do. bit. <laughs> You're looking good. Um, <laughs> so I started with the website, and there were models to follow. And, and you know, I was playing and testing, posting content, and then I learned about uh, this thing called AdSense that Google had, you know, not too long ago, you know, put out. And I put it on my website and, and I made three bucks or something. And I was um, like, hey, if I can make three bucks for doing it like this, then maybe I can make a hundred bucks doing it like this and started adding more content and, and, and tweaking the ads. And um, I learned, I, was, I became the expert at SEO and, and ad placements and getting good content out there and also making money doing it. And we had a hundred thousand pages of content on that website. Um, and then I got hooked on YouTube because I'm a visual person. I'd much rather see something than, than like audio. Like if this was an audio interview, I'd have a really hard time. I'd, I'd be like super focused because mm-hmm. in fact, I am so visual that I like I'm the same way. I can't do it. <laughs> um, but it's awesome. Like learn, understand how you learn and hack it and then, and then live it. So, but for me, I'm visual. And so I'd much rather do video than, than read uh, an article or read a book. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to try making video content. And same thing. I struggled. I, I, you know, I had my website still going, making me money. That was my business. But I was playing in YouTube and trying to find a way to turn it into something. YouTube at the time, there was no model though, right? I mean, the website, there was an established model. YouTube, there was no model. There, this, I started 11 years ago. There were no thought leaders on YouTube. Uh, YouTube was short meme videos uh, of a man falling down the stair or like a cat with a care ball or, you know, something just short and stupid. Uh, nobody's making 10 minute plus thought leadership content. <laughs> so I started cause I liked it, but it took me, it took me five years to get the 7,000 subscribers from zero to five years, 7,000 subscribers. And then the next five years, I went from 7,000 subscribers to 2 million. And then we launched a whole bunch of different channels, Russian, you know, Spanish, a whole bunch of different ones. Um, so partly is that I got smarter and I got better. If you go back and watch my first videos, I was, I was really bad. I wasn't engaging. I sucked on camera. I was super nervous and sweating and all that. Um, but partly YouTube also caught up. Like YouTube now, if you're an expert, if you have something to teach and you're not on YouTube, you're missing a huge opportunity. YouTube should be the number one place where you're creating long form content to build your brand. It's, it's the number one place where when I started, it was nothing. Nobody, you're like, you were stupid to go there. So, and I didn't predict that. I'm not, I wasn't that smart. It just happened to be the only video place at the time. And I like video. So that's where I went. Um, 
So I always like trying to model success. I like trying to figure out how to make something work. And if it, if it hasn't worked yet inside your model, find somebody else in a different industry that you can learn from and apply to, uh, to make it work for you. So you're saying you weren't an overnight success. Right. Yeah. I, I honestly, I think my journey is a lot slower than most people. Um, it's why I kept all my videos up. You can go back and watch the first video I did on Walt Disney. Uh, it's still on the channel and it's, it's cringe to look at for me, at least. Um, I'm nervous. I'm trying to memorize my scripts and lines, but you can see the journey of how long it took me to get here. And I'm, I'm an introvert by nature. I wasn't a great speaker. It took a long time to get here, you know, 7,000 videos or something. And so I think, I think most of your audience could get there much faster than I did, but I just kept going. Like if anything, I'm just, the thing to model for me is the consistency. I am consistent. I post videos when I, when I was, I have my broken neck. I still film videos. There's videos of me sitting there in a chair like this, still filming short videos because I have a concussion. I can't think very well, but we're still like, I still like videos have to go up. Videos are going up. So you can model that for me. But um, most of the other stuff did not come natural. And it's just a lot of practice and hard work and effort. And what was the drive to keep that consistency? I can imagine today's entrepreneurs zero to five years, 7,000 subscribers, they'd be like, "Uh, uh-uh, I'm out. Um, you know, I interviewed Jordan Harbinger recently and he said that in his first, you know, 10 years of podcasting, like it was just no downloads, no downloads, no downloads. And then all of a sudden something kind of clicked. How were you able to maintain that consistency or do you tie it back to the purpose? Yeah, it's still that I, I always see it as I'm helping, like I look at the number and I'm helping somebody. So if, if 40 people watched my video, right? People often think of that, oh, 40, only 40 people saw my video. If you were to do a speech, you know, at a library or something, and you had 40 people in front of you, you'd be blown away. You'd be like nervous. You'd be scared. You'd be shaking. You'd, be, you'd, you'd walk away saying, oh my God, I did this my first speech. You know, you'd be blown away to have 40 people show up to hear you say something. And so it's always just meant something to me that there's, there's people watching. As much as I still want to grow and get better and get bigger, and, and I, w- I, I compare myself to the progress, like, did I get better? Did I improve? Am I getting better on camera? Is it getting better results than I did yesterday? But not being disappointed by having 40 people on it. Um, I started a new YouTube gaming channel where I play League of Legends and I answer questions for a couple hours in the night. And yesterday we had, I don't know, 11 people on or something, (laughs) but it's the best. Like those are 11 people and I get to interact with them and I'm playing a video game and answering business questions. Like it's amazing. And I still, you know, if it's at some point it's got to grow, right? If it's still 11 people in two years, that's a problem. You want to see that go from 11 to 13 to 17 to 20 to 30. Right. But I don't, I just feel connected more to the there's 11 people watching who are taking time out of their day to be here with me that hopefully I can help them with their business. That connection uh, keeps me going, but also is much more purposeful because you feel like the work you're doing matters. When you wake up and you feel like the work you do matters is going to mean something to somebody. You're in a totally different spot, totally different vibe, totally different motivation than if you wake up today and it's like, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. What I do, that's not going to matter if I wake up today and and go to work. Nobody cares. Like that's how you end up depressed, upset. Um, and it's what I want to try to unlock in as many people as I can. I appreciate you sharing that, man. I think that whole, even that one person watching one conversation can change your life, their life, one idea, one sort of inspiration. Um, Evan, I know we only have a couple minutes left and I just want to ask you a little bit of I want to ask you your approach on relationships. Uh, okay. you, said you're, you said you're a bit of an introvert now. Obviously, you're on stage. You're crushing speeches. Wh- where do you find most people go wrong when it comes to building relationships? Like business connection kind of relationships? Business connections. I mean, you know, you're probably getting, quote, prospected and spammed all the time. And I'm just curious kind of like how, how you were able to build amazing relationships and where do you see people go wrong when it comes to even trying to build relationships? Okay, with- so how did this happen? Because I get asked, like I'm going to go into my Instagram DMs and there'll be 40 people who want me to be on their podcast. So, so break down for people how 
this happened. Because it's not like I grew up with you and I've known you for you know a decade or something. So how did how did what was your process to make this interview happen? I sent you a video that was very personalized, referenced a recent podcast guest, and said, "Hey, I think your audience or your message would land really well with my audience." And I just launched this podcast. I'm on a, about episode twenty. Would love to have you on. Okay. Um, there had to have been more heart to it too. <laughs> Um, so I'll make, I mean, I'll often make calls just off of how I feel about the person, right? So normally they're talking about head versus heart. This doesn't make sense. Guy's got 20 episodes, you know, I'm turning down big interviews to why would I do this? It doesn't make any sense, but I want to, like, I like this dude. I don't know. There's something about him that's, yeah. I don't even know what my calendar looks like. I said, okay, message my assistant and, and she'll find the time. And we made it happen. Um, so I think, I think leaning in with your heart to show them that you care about them and that you, you want to help them somehow um, spread their message. Uh, I, like, I like being their chief goal officer. So if you want to build a relationship with somebody, uh, understand what they value most right now. What are they trying to accomplish? And then you find a way to help them. Even if you can't do it yourself, you find somebody who can help them out. So be their chief goal officer, starting with what you might be able to do for them before you ask anything. Um, a lot of the people who hit my radar are the ones who are super active in my community. There are some people who are in my community who are posting uh, comments every day, showing love to other people, in the, in the community every day. And that's something that I value, obviously. Like if you know my content, my brand, I want to spread believe other communities would be more like you stood up for me and you like raged on that person and you know, okay, whatever. So understand, be their chief goal officer, understand what they value most, pay attention to the platform where they're hanging out the most. Most of the people who you want to build a relationship with are probably on every platform, but they're not actually responding themselves to the comments. So if you're following somebody, if you're following, you know, Grant Cardone, he's got lots of YouTube videos, but he's not in the comments at all. So you could be typing your face off every day in the comments and like it never makes a dent, but he's paying attention to his Instagram. And if you're responding to comments on Instagram and then when he goes live, he sees 40 people want to join in requests to come in live, he might pick you because... He recognizes your face because of all the value that you brought, right? So you be their chief goal officer, figure out where they're spending their most time, and then, and then be a known quantity so that they recognize your face. They see you as somebody who's really helpful to their community. And, and it, they almost feel guilted into finding a way to help you out. Chief goal officer. I chief goal one. officer. Yeah, because what you think is valuable may not be valuable to them. This is the thing. Like, here's what I can do for you. Here's how I can help. But they may not value that at all. So what do they actually care about? And then help them go get it. And you're the guy. Like, I want to be more valuable as um, I built a list of, I want to say maybe 75 people right now, of people who could move the needle for my business, who are, you know, grants on that list. And listen, I've done a lot with grants over the years anyway. So, but I, I forget to maintain relationships. So I have an Evernote file where if I haven't been in touch with them for the past three months, I find a way to bring them value. I find a way to help. And so I might go to their Instagram and see what they're posting. What are they talking about? What's on their mind right now? And then can I help them? Maybe it's, maybe it's YouTube help. Maybe it's book, book shout out, like something to, to be of value to them. And every three months, at least I'm finding a way to, to be of value to them. But what I'm good at, you know, I, I'm a good salsa dancer. Great. That doesn't mean that Grant Cardone wants to learn salsa dancing. Right. So be their chief goal officer to reverse engineer. And my goal is to be more valuable than their own team. I want to bring them more value on the thing that they care about. Like they're struggling right now to get their new book out. I want to be more valuable for him or her on their book launch than their own team. It's just good karma. It's just good like human thing to do. But then when you need something, like when I did, when I did like built to serve, right? I had, who's done a read? It's like Grant Cardone had me on. Tom Billiard did a read. Brendan Burchard did a read. Uh, I can't even, Jay Shetty did a read. Like Lewis Howes did a read. All these people have done 
promotions and reads for the book. Why? Because I helped them so much with what they were doing and I brought a lot of value to their relationship. So trying to bring that value first, be their chief goal officer, staying in touch with people. Some people are naturally good at it. I suck. So I have to have it in my Evernote to remind myself. Um, yeah, and, and being top of mind so that when you actually need something, you've got a pool of people to pull on. Man, Evan, this has been incredibly, incredibly valuable. My one final question is tomorrow morning, the entire world wakes up, every city, every country, and everyone's looking at the exact same billboard. But Evan gets to control the message on that billboard. What do you write? I, I operate like that's actually happening every day. And the billboard is, is my content, whether it's a YouTube channel or Instagram or, or uh, books or whatever, because that's actually happening. Um, and the message is believe. If it's on the billboard, it's just hashtag believe. That's it. And that's the main theme for everything. I, I, I just want people to believe in themselves more because I think it's the world's biggest problem. And um, I'm not going to solve it in my lifetime, but I'm going to try to unlock as many people as I can on this journey. If you want to see another awesome interview I did, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.